I congratulate our panel on behaving themselves when it comes to time frames. That means we do have um, time for discussion and questions, so that falls to you. Now the ball's in your court, uh, and uh, I invite you to ask any or all of our presenters about their, their work that's, I think, very important because it highlights some of the most important people in our community, our nurses, our firefighters, emergency dispatchers, and all these kind of people who serve us so well. So, any questions or comments? Yes, back here. Um, I noticed a lot of you have coping measures in your research, and I was interested if any of you looked at negative coping strategies like alcohol use in first responders, and why you picked the certain ones you did, and why didn't focus on alcohol use. There's a mic there. Oh, okay. All right, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, I actually, yes, I the one analysis that I presented did include the more what considered you know, defined as passive coping, which did include uh, substance use, behavioral disengagement, denial, and a couple others. Uh, I did include the more positive coping or adaptive coping. Uh, that's in some subsequent analyses that I think largely due to the lack of power did not really play out well uh, with the data set. So I mean, I, in other words, I did include, I did include them. They aren't playing out as well or as clearly in my sample right now. I'm hoping to get a better picture with a, a little bit more end. Does that answer your question? Do you want to say something? Okay. Because a lot of times when people are reporting coping, they do it in emotion focused coping mm -hmm. or on the self tape you had seen others talking mm -hmm. about. And I was wondering just about that. Mm -hmm. So maybe Kathy may have answered it. I haven't had any particular studies. I do want to talk about the issues that we had, <laughs> which I had with paramedics some years ago. But oh, oh this is great. <laughs> Um, so I did include the coping rescue workers inventory in my study. Um, it didn't wind up in the structural coping model because it didn't work very well. So we included that measure because it was created specifically for rescue workers. So it's it's coping more specific to what we would expect to see in, in, in first responders and emergency service workers. Um, but it just, the reliabilities were not there. Um, still trying to figure out exactly what that might mean, but it just wasn't turning out to be a very robust measure. One of the things with coping is that when you're looking at whether coping is adaptive or not, um, that can be different depending on what population. So dissociation and disengagement is generally considered to be a maladaptive coping strategy, but actually in one of the other studies that we didn't get to report, um, dissociation is actually quite helpful for emergency service workers, presuming that after the event they're able to re-engage um, and, and deal with it. So. There's a little bit of a problem with the way some people operate in that sense. I, mean, I think you addressed it well mm -hmm. that you know nurses, depending on what context, if they're in the work environment or home, would use different coping strategies. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated that as well. Thank you. Interventions in the past 20 years have been in this kind of industry and in the military where uh, these sorts of support has been supposedly an important thing and then you find out that actually it's not as important um, or that coping various ways of dealing with things have been bestowed upon people rather than allowing people's natural coping and social support networks to kick in. Um, these in the two studies, the second and third um, papers that, that, you, um, that we spoke about today, we talked about instrumental and emotional support and giving and receiving instrumental and emotional support. And receiving emotional support tends to be just feeling valued by people, feeling that sense of connection, knowing that if you need somebody that there is a network available to you, whether that is your peer support network or your family network. You know, so I've been working with emergency services for quite a long time now. And for as many paramedics, for example, as I ask, who would be your source of support? Who's the first person you turn to when you need help? As many who say a colleague because they've walked a mile in my shoes, you get 
um, family that I don't want to talk to people at work. So you have as many people who say, if I show that I'm weak in any way at all to my colleagues, I could get pulled off the back of a truck um, and, and taken away from doing what I really love to do. You have the opposite. You have people who will say, do you speak to a spouse? Some people will say, yeah, sure. Usually when they're in an allied health industry. So if I'm a paramedic or an emergency medical dispatcher and I'm married to someone else in that job or a nurse uh, or what have you, then I will talk to them because they'll understand me and my spouse and what have you. But a lot of people don't want to put that kind of what they perceive to be perhaps pressure on their spouses about sharing the ins and outs or intricacies of some you know, pretty hideous things. So I think the take home message really is that you really allow people to do whatever it is that works for them. I was interested when Deanne's results came out because in previous years, I had worked with praise of coping as being something that people really was beneficial in terms of predicting post-traumatic growth. That's the figuring out why I'm doing the job I'm doing, reminding myself why I joined this job in the first place, that sort of thing. And it didn't come out with Deanne's stuff. It was all about self-care, so it was. If you want to sit under a tree and read a book, then do that. If you want to go for a bike ride, do that. Those self-care strategies were all about that. Um, so I think it's about being um, reflexive, um, being uh, in touch with yourself, with your emotions. As Dan was saying, reconnecting after the absolutely necessary disconnection that we need to make to make emotion to be instrumentally useful to somebody at the scene of a crisis, you then need to be able to re-engage with that, and those self-care strategies seem to be really important. I'm thinking as as you asked this question of of a um, uh, of a bereaved parent one time who told me this about basically about social support. Uh, she had uh, some friends whose uh, child died about five years after hers died, and she wanted to go and provide some support to them. And this is what she told me about that. She said, "If I have anything to tell people about this, it would be." Um, you go there and you be with them. If they want to talk, you talk. If they don't, you don't. All you can do is be there for another person. And I think that's the basis of it. You know, beyond that, you have to figure out what that person is like and what they need and their particulars. But the presence, I think, is the essential element. Mm. I find that especially with men. That sometimes, sometimes they just they need to know that you're there, but don't necessarily need to. Yes. I have a question for uh, Diane. Um, in your special evaluation model, you uh, use um, social support and organizational loneliness as a mediator, mm -hmm. and you also looked at whether they had a moderating role in the relation mm -hmm. between operational organizational stress and well-being. Uh, I have started to, mm -hmm. um, but haven't quite untangled that analysis yet. Uh, but if you look at the correlations between predictors and outcomes at high and, and low levels of social support in particular, um, you do find that if you have high social support, the relationships tend to weaken. If you have low social support, that's when we have really um, strong, particularly negative relationships between predictors and outcomes. Right. So yeah, it, there is moderation happening there as well. Way back in the back there. So, um, measured that, but if I wanted to refer to the model created for post-traumatic growth, um, yeah, so there, there's theory in the model about the presence of uh, post-traumatic growth schemas and ideas, so if you're in a group where there are notions that people can grow from trauma, um, then you're more likely to experience trauma yourself, so there is a, a contagion kind of effect. More likely to experience growth in yourself, yeah. yes. Is that what I said? Um, sorry. Yes. Well, the, the fact that in a qualitative uh, piece that Deanne's also executed with fire and rescue workers, the people two years after their recruitment, mm -hmm. that the crew, the, the, the cohesiveness between the crew is really important. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because in our state at the moment, the powers that be are wanting to casualise the workforce right. and 
was in the qualitative research were coming up with this, you know, if, if I don't feel that I know the people on the truck, on the firefighter truck or what have you, if I can't rely on them at that time of crisis, if I have to think about who's coming in and what their role might be, or if the station officer, the leader of that particular truck, is not uh, somebody who I feel that I can trust and rely on, then that does undermine people's sense of, of, of wellbeing and their capacity to deal with the work that they do. So, yeah, cohesion and what have you, and, and as Deanne was suggesting, the norms of kind of aspect of, of being able to deal with things and, and withstand those pressures. Yeah. And while I haven't done this particular research study yet, um, as far as the, sort of the environmental contagion, that has been found pretty consistently in the burnout literature. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, you know, future research. Mm -hmm. Question right there? It's so interesting you say that because that's another area where some of the motivation of looking at this because um, there's also there's a great article and I can't remember where it's from but it's it says it's titled something along the lines of nursing those who eat their young or something that it was it's all about ladder <laughs> and it's all about the sort of lateral violence that they have with each other and number one first nurses on nurse you know sort of well violence and it is it's 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 not it's more like almost use this analogy but high school yeah. um, where you know girls picking on other girls kind of environment um, but on top of that yes dealing with you know the environment and that's and I think that relates back to what you're saying in the sense of this is yes we have to have empirical support for why we design the interventions we design but a lot of it has to come from an organizational standpoint a lot of it has to come from um, how the organization not only uh, structures its workforce but also what it will tolerate um, and that has to start, you know, all the way from the top on down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was quite a bit of, uh, I, you know, not necessarily just on the maternity, or well, there was the neonatal NICU uh, that we had, but across the board, I mean, all the qualitative responses were, there were a number of them where, again, just like you're saying, like the doctor told the family, oh, he's dying, mm -hmm. you know, and then walks off, you know, and it's like, <laughs> so. So, would you, I mean, it sounds like in some cases, Well, there's that's a complex question. That's a complex question and a complex answer. And one being is is that um, again going back to the nursing and retention, nursing and retention relative to turnover, uh, there seems to be a uh, effect where if you look at most of the nursing literature, it's obviously cross sectional. And then the nurses who've been there the longest have these low levels. It seems like the younger nurses have the problems, quote unquote. They have the trauma responses. They have you know all the more of the emotional upheavals. So the question, though, is because most of it's cross-sectional, is this really reflective of um, younger nurses have more trauma responses, or is this a self-selection bias where nurses who, through whatever reasons, have some sort of dispositional or were in the environment at the time, um, and therefore they have stayed in the field, they have stayed in the position uh, relative to the ones who have dealt with, you know, who were more impacted in the early phases and then self-selected out and went to a different field. I actually saw a patient uh, not long ago um, who was working in oncology and, and she was just absolutely miserable and, and, and then a few months later she actually went over to the uh, labor and delivery she's very happy now. Uh, <laughs> so there's that question. So yeah, it, it, like I said, it's, I think it's a complex question and you have to kind of take, if you're talking clinically, I think you have to take case by case. And what was actually kind of startling was seeing the rates of this. It was like 45% of them were reporting moderate to severe postnatal yeah. stress symptoms. I mean, it's just like that. But we, ha we have to be advocates.
Well, thank you very much for coming today, and I appreciate your comments and questions. And if you have some more for our panel, you can meet with them uh, afterwards. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.